Welcome everybody from around the world. My name is Bilal Abdul Karim, and this is our weekly question and answer show. Uh, we're going to be looking to answer your questions, deal with your comments, um, your concerns, anything that you think is going to be relevant to that which is taking place here in northern Syria or that which is taking place in the Muslim world, we'll try to answer your questions as uh, best as we possibly can. Now, we are broadcasting live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So you can take the link and you can share it um, uh, with your friends. They can tune in and we can see what they have to say about um about whatever it is that they think is relevant to what we're going to be talking about. All right, everybody, um, just to let everybody know, this is your show. So do feel free to send in your questions, comments, and or concerns. We are looking forward uh, to hearing from you. Um, uh, 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 I think what we're going to do right now, there's a video that I would like to show um, the brothers and sisters that are out there watching right now. And it's about uh, one young man who uh, came here to fight for the sake of Allah. His name is, is uh, Saif Allah, and uh, he's from France. Um, he's been, unfortunately, in one of the prisons of Abu Muhammad Jolani, and he's been there for about seven months. Um, look, I want to play a clip for you that we produced here at OGN and take a look at it and then we'll get a chance to talk about it in a minute. My name is Bilal Abdul Kareem for OGN's program, Justice. Today, we're going to be discussing the case of Saifullah Faransi. Saifullah Faransi came to Syria in 2017. He fought in numerous battles against the regime and has done rebat in numerous different places around the free territories uh, um, against the forces of Bashar al-Assad. Now, the issue concerning Saifullah Faransi is that he is currently in one of Abu Muhammad Jolani or Hayat Tahrir Shams prisons. One of the consistent things that, uh, uh, that we are seeing as a pattern of behavior with the other stories in which we've brought you in recent times, and that is, one, he has no official charge levied against him in spite of the fact that he's been in prison for the past seven months. Two, he has had no access to a lawyer, no representation, no opportunity to defend himself judicially. And three, and which is one of the most important things, is that we have credible information that he too has been tortured in Jolani's prison. Now, one of the uh, things that we are going to continue to bring forward to the uh, Syrian people is that it is time to raise your voices. It is time to ask the questions. Why is this young man in prison and is, has no access to any justice representation? And are we looking for some type of forced confession by way of torture? Finally, I'd like to mention one interesting thing, that there's a rumor that's basically been swirling around both domestically here in Syria and internationally that Abu Muhammad Jolani is colluding with Western security forces to be able to contain the Muhajireen here in Syria. Here is an interesting conversation that U.S. journalist Martin Smith had with uh, uh, James Jeffries, who is the former ambassador to Damascus. It is as follows. Martin Smith. During the Trump years, Jolani reached out to Ambassador Jeffrey through intermediaries. Were you receiving messages from Hayat Tahrir Shan? James Jeffrey? Yes. Martin Smith. What were those messages? James Jeffrey. Basically, we want to be your friend. We're not terrorists, we're just fighting Assad. Okay, uh, I hope that the message was clear. I think it was probably a little bit uh, choppy the way that it played. But uh, if you'd like to watch it, you can find this video uh, that was posted just uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, you can find it on our Twitter page, um, OGN, Bilal Abdul Kareem, Facebook, and YouTube. Now, we are going to uh, give you an opportunity to comment on that or ask whatever questions that might be relevant. So let's go to your questions and see what, um, what, what, what we have uh, uh, here. All righty.
Mo Maestro says, what are the ulama and shiuch like Sheikh al-Mahdi say about Hayat Tahrir Sham? And are they aware of the torture? Uh, Sheikh uh, Abdul Razak al-Mahdi um, is uh, very sick. Um, he was uh, struck down by Corona. Um, he does, um, I have not had an opportunity to see him, um, but I have sat with him and I did explain the situation to him the last time that I saw him. Of course, he's not up for, uh, uh, for torture, doesn't see it as permissible. Um, uh, but I think I shouldn't speak for Sheikh Abdul Razak and um, he would uh, speak for himself. He has a telegram channel. We're gonna try to get that to you. Um, I have spoken to Dr. Hani Savari, who um, uh, is an authority on this topic um, as he is a well-known uh, Islamic scholar. And on top of that, he's a lawyer to go along with it. And he has condemned uh, Hayat Tahrir Sham for their torture and the role that they're playing in in basically destroying this revolution. Um, we will look to have an interview with him uh, coming up this week, inshallah ta'ala. Um, he also has been ill, so we've had to delay it a bit. So let's make, uh, let's make dua that inshallah we will be able to get the interview done because I would like for everybody to hear it directly from him. Uh, next. Uh, we've got here, Curly Whirly, who says, Ahi Bilal, I see you are Brother Tox uh, trying to expose HTS for their crimes. Do you fear that HTS would attempt to assassinate you and Brother Tox like ISIS did to its foes? Um, look, if I'm just talking straight business here, we're dealing with a, a, an organization that doesn't listen to any Islamic scholars, number one. Number two, they um, imprison Muslims indefinitely and keep them. Three, they torture prisoners when they are, uh, 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 torture their detainees in their prisons. So is it a big jump that people who do these types of things um, wouldn't pull off assassinations? That doesn't look like a big jump to me, but Allah knows best, I don't know. You know, maybe you could, uh, um, I don't know, <laughs> ask Jolani. But it doesn't seem like a big jump uh, 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 to me. And Allah knows best. Okay, we've got here. Um, Omar bin Yahya says, May Allah give you and your family Jannah to fit those for the work you do. Love from Denmark. Amin, amin. Hey, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Um... All righty, um, we have here. Next, we've got here, Ikar Hussein who says, Salam Bilal, Wa Alaikum Salam. Would you say the rectification of our ummah is down to people of knowledge educating the masses? Is there a correlation with ignorance of the people and our state in your view? Absolutely, absolutely, 150%. Um, because most of the problems that we are facing here have very, very real Islamic solutions. But a lot of the people don't know the rulings. And some people know the rulings, but ignore them. And that's going to happen when, the, when there's a weakness of Iman. But I'll tell you one thing. Um, if we're going to correct the situation here in Syria, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a push from the people of knowledge. It's going to take that push. They've got to re-engage here in Syria and, um, and and that's really all there is to it. There has to be more effort to give more dawah. Now, people may sit there and say, well, look, our situation here is dire. It's not the time for dawah. Look, our situation here has been dire since 2012. No, 2011. So um, it's not going to get better. And we're going to have to understand that the way to get things to move in a positive direction has got to come through knowledge. Has to. It has to. All right. Okay, True Freeman, AKA The God TV. Bilal, I think you're pushing it. It's like you are begging HTS to arrest you so you can play the victim. Exactly why would I want to be arrested by people who are known to torture their detainees it's well documented. They totally admitted it when I was there. 
I heard the screams. And you're telling me that in some way that means that I want to get arrested so that I could play the victim. Does that make sense to anybody? It doesn't make sense to me. But if somebody thinks it does make sense, then maybe you could let me know. Um, but in addition to that, he says that I am pushing it. Um, when they're torturing Muslims, that's pushing it. Indefinitely detaining them, is that pushing it? No lawyer, no representation so they can free themselves, is that pushing it? I don't know. Strange. It's very strange. Okay, um, next, Abdullah says, what's your opinion on Ben Salman's policies and big festivals in Saudi Arabia? It's a big musiba. It is a huge, um, uh, it is just a black spot, uh, 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 you know, uh, on the heart of the ummah that this fool and his father are in charge of the greatest oil wealth in the world and he's just a big fool. Uh, if you look at all of his failures, he's the architect, Mohammed bin Salman, of the uh, war in Yemen. War. It, when you look in the hospitals with the, with the sick people, not sick people, with the injured people in those hospitals and the malnutrition children, who's sitting next to him? Women wearing the cubs. What are you doing? What is this war all about? You see, oh yes, I have forgotten. It's all about Iran. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so anyway, so we're saying that we're gonna kill the Muslims in Yemen because it's about Iran who wants to kill the Muslims. So you're doing it for them. Yeah, and that makes sense to somebody. Well, it makes sense to him because Mohammed bin Salman not only is the crown prince, but he's also the defense minister. So there's nobody really to blame. And so then when he comes, it's obvious that the Islamic rulings mean nothing to him. And therefore, he wants to have some, some women uh, uh, up on stage just, you know, putting their, 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 their goodies on display and all. And you have a bunch of foolish Saudis that are just, um, you know, that, that just can't see it. They just can't see it. They can't see it. But um, it's unfortunate. But <laughs> Allah has a way of dealing with people like that. Mm. Next. Mo Maestro says, what is the situation with uh, Shishani? Omar, um, uh, Muslim uh, Shishani uh, uh, did leave the mountain, uh, mountain areas of Turkmen. Um, he is now in uh, an area uh, where he is surrounded uh, with the Turkestani uh, who are uh, allied with Haya, um, but it's less than being in the custody of Haya. So, um, you know, this situation is, is, is a serious situation because it is widely believed, and I'm one of the people who believe it, that um, Haya's Tahrir Sham wanted Muslim Shishani out of the Turkmen mountains because they plan to give those territories away uh, back to the regime. He's done it before. He's done it several times. I was there and I looked at all of the signs, a lack of troops, um, uh, no preparation. I'm not talking about little preparation, I'm talking about no preparation. No uh, bombs um, were planted to give the regime a hard time to come into the cities or anything like that. It was just a complete and total pullout and therefore um, uh, uh, regime forces just walked right into Khan Sheikhoun, Sarakib, Maratun um, Arman, these were major strongholds, and their loss really, really hurt this revolution. To this day, Joe Lanny or anybody else with him has never answered for that. Um, so I do believe that that is what why they wanted Muslim Shishani out of those areas because it was um, he he was not going to cooperate if um, uh, uh, and when. Uh, Abu Muhammad Jolani wanted to hand those territories over to the regime. He was not going to cooperate with that. And they knew that. Next, Abdullah Ifti says, many of the brothers want to know, why are you picking these topics against Mujahids in this dire time? Are you biased on one particular side? Please clear the confusion, uh, confusion circulating. Okay, um, first of all, uh, I would like to say this. 
Um, I do not consider defending Muslims who are being tortured in prison and who have no way to free themselves. Um, I don't call that picking on Muslims. Um, you know, if, if you're picking on them and you say, hey, you know, you didn't wear your pants above your ankles. Or you might say, you know, let's talk about the length of Joe Lanny's beard. Or let's talk about uh, this or that. We're talking about um, people who, um, who've lost their homes, uh, territories which have been given up. Uh, I mean, it was the regime who would put people in prison and just lock them up and throw away the key and would torture them. I just can't see that that, me that, that is tantamount to uh, saying you're picking on the Mujahids. And a Mujahid does not imprison his brother unjustly. He gives him an opportunity to defend himself in an Islamic court. They have not done that, are not doing that. And um, so uh, I don't call that picking on them. And I don't think anybody else out there uh, who looks at it objectively does either. Next. Mm. Okay. Next. Um, why is Shishani not doing jihad in his countries? Muslims are, suppo are also oppressed in Russia. Well, maybe we'll have one to guess one day and you could ask. But I don't understand what that actually means for you. Why isn't he doing um, uh, jihad there? Why isn't he doing it here? What's, what's the problem with that? Is there a problem with him doing his jihad in Syria? Didn't the Prophet uh, say, Alaikum Bisham? I know the Prophet said that. Um, so I don't know. Mm, I, I think it's, it's up to him, it's his choice. Um, next. Idris Smith says, there are indeed smoke and mirrors being used here. We hope the brother is released from this unfortunate situation. It seems Islam isn't the primary goal for this organization. That's crystal clear to me. Um, yes, I agree with you that you can't make a case that Islam is the goal um, of uh, Hayat Tahrir Sham's leadership. You just can't. There's just too much clear cut evidence that this is not the case. Who are their scholars? Who are their people of knowledge? Nobody puts their name on any of the fatawa, if you wanna call it that, which they don't come out with any fatawa anyway, but there's no person of knowledge here in Syria who puts their stamp on it. They, nobody does. How are you an Islamic movement and you have no backing from the ulama? I just don't understand that. Interesting thing. Okay. Next, Curly Whirly, who says, Brother, do you believe some Muhajireen like Brother Abdul Samad Dagul are in the pockets of HTS and defend them without real justification? Yes, I do believe that. I do. I, I think that uh, Abdul Samad Dagul is a talented young brother, but I've sat in Abdul, uh, Abdul Samad's house. I've explained these concerns to him very clearly and, and all. He, and uh, to be real with you, he doesn't really try to defend them with me. He just sits there and he says, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, well, you know, and that's pretty much what it is. So I'm very disappointed in Abdul Samad because I know he has no defense for them. Um, I, I, I believe he has his starting his new show or anything like that. And it would be great to ask him uh, some of the questions why he defends people who are known to torture, known for doing stuff like that. Um, why does he continue to defend them? And, you know, I'm not going to turn this into a personal, like, urinating contest or something. Um, you know, he said this, I said that, you said this, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. I'm not going to turn it into that. I'm going to say, look, um, if you're defending these people, um, then um, are you unaware that they're torturing people? And if you are unaware, then how do you explain the different reports that OGN has been producing? Um, are you saying that those reports are inaccurate? They are lies. Are you saying that you don't know those people? Because he does know those people. And that's real. Next. All right. Um, 
Okay, next. Zane Travolta says, she Shani gets to fight Russia and Assad in Syria. Kills two birds with one stone, Ahi. That too. That works also. That works also. Next. Kashin Kojin says, Salama alaikum Bilal. Why still didn't speak about the Abu Fatima group? What exactly do you want to say about the Abu Fatima group? Um, and maybe you would like to speak about the Abu Fatima group. But most of us here in Syria <laughs> had never heard of the Abu Fatima group before 10 days ago. <clears throat> and even if HTS was genuine that they were after only the Abu Fatima group and not Muslim Shishani, which is totally bogus, um, then why did Muslim Shishani have to give up his positions out there? Can you explain that? If they were only after Abu Fatima, then there was no reason for Muslim Shishani to have to give up his positions. Once they got Abu Fatima, if that's who they were really after and all, then it would be no problem for him to continue to do what he was doing. Wherein Haiti was said, no, no, Muslim Shishani, this is our guy, we like him. But yet you removed him from the place that he was at. Why did you do that? Unless the goal was to remove Muslim Shishani and those forces that were loyal to him from those areas, as I said. Next. Um, um, Priya Ahmed says, what is your opinion of the UAE and what is their involvement in Syria? Well, they haven't had any real involvement here in Syria in an up, up close and personal um, uh, way in quite some years, but they are very, very anti-Islamic. Don't let the outfits fool you. Um, the first country to reopen the Syrian uh, embassy in the Muslim world was who? Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates. So while Bashar al-Assad was and still is killing Muslims, um, they're basically saying, look, we're gonna welcome you back into the fold. Come on back in, the ward is fine. Um, but the Nahyan family in, um, in Abu Dhabi, they've been doing things like this for a long time. They use the oil and gas wealth that they have, the immense oil and gas wealth that they have, so that they can control certain movements and then destroy them. This is a well-known tactic from, from these individuals, and they've been doing it for a long time. Um, it has been suspected that the UAE was behind the killing of the leadership of Ahrar Sham back in, I believe this was 2014, um, where the entire leadership of, uh, of uh, Ahrar Sham was wiped, was wiped out. Um, I cannot confirm that, these are allegations, but I would believe it if it turned out to be true because they've been doing things like that for a long time. Just look at their involvement in Sudan, their involvement in Yemen, and their involvement here in Syria, if you want um, more information. Next. <clears throat> Ikar Hussein says, what's the status of the people in Sham in terms of their knowledge and, and, and deen, I believe it is? Are the masses practicing their deen or is there a lot of bid'ah? Are the people of Sham more um, uh, of Sham uh, of more Arab national mentality? Okay, first of all, uh, let's take this one step at a time. Um, uh, in terms of their knowledge and deen, uh, the reality of the situation is that during the years of Bashar al-Assad and their father, half of the Assad, um, the real dawah of Islam was not allowed to spread. So the population was generally ignorant of their religion. Um, it's unfortunate. Um, it wasn't by their choice, but it just wasn't available. And when the true Islam was taught, it was fought. Now that, the, um, that uh, things have changed on the ground, the dawah is still not nearly as strong as it could slash should be. Um, so therefore you find the people um, are not as religiously committed as they possibly could be if the dawah was stronger. Um, so this, uh, this is a process. 
It's going to take time. It's not going to happen in a day. And I think that it's important that we bear that in mind. Um, <clears throat> are the people of Sham um, more of Arab national mentality? Not really. Not really. They have a very, very, very soft heart um, and a soft heart for, heart for the religion of Islam. But we need more of the people of knowledge to support the dawah here. And that's, that's real. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Next, we've got uh, Najmuddin Dashak. Akhi Bilal, I love you for the sake of Allah. I love you for the sake of the one whom you love me for. And the Prophet وسلم, uh, said, Who our love his brother for the sake of Allah, let him tell him that. And I appreciate that. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Next. What's it like being Muslim in New York? How's the community there generally? I wish I could answer this question. I wish I could go to New York, stay for like about a week. I'd just eat all the food, all the Italian food I could eat, all the cheesecake I could eat, and I would have a great time. But I wouldn't want to stay. I'd want to come back. The reality is that I haven't been in New York in about, wow, it's going back some years. So I really couldn't tell you what the situation is like of the, in the Muslim community in New York. I, I wish I could, but I just can't. Um, all right, let's take a look and see what we've got here. Mm, Jun, Junood Sham says, you speak like it is facts, yet everyone here knows you would record in the back lines and, and then go back to border region of Atma to hide with women and children. You are a hypocrite. I don't live in Atma. <laughs> Next question. Um, let's see what we have here. <clears throat> Um, let's see here. We got to take maybe two more questions, maybe three. We'll take a look. Uh, Abu Anas uh, Cologne says, my friend, do you feel the situation is going to get better or get worse? I feel like the situation is going to get better. Um, I really do. There are good pieces which are in place. Um, and I think that uh, the Syrian people are ready for change. I don't think that the reign of Abu Muhammad Jolani and other people who would seek to profit off of the blood of the Syrian people is going to go on forever. I just don't see it like that. Um, I think that the frustration is growing, and I think that there will be changes um, in, in the coming uh, days and weeks and months ahead. Um, we hope that there are positive changes. Um, I would hope that Hayat Shahir Shem would uh, repent from what they're doing, and then, you know, and then we could all move on um, as one. Is it possible? It's definitely possible, and we hope it is. But we've got to have the support of the ulama uh, here, and we are working to bring that about. So yes, I do think that better days are in front of us now. Okay. All right, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, let's take a look and see what we have here. Uh, Akbar M says, what do you think about Hezbollah Tahrir um, hoping that the Syrian army will give them Nusra to establish Khilafah? Do you think the Syrian army is full of sincere soldiers as they claim? I have never, ever, heard uh, Hezbollah Tahrir make an assertion that the Syrian Arab army is going to give them victory. It's the very first time I've ever heard that. I think you need to go back and maybe take a look at that and check it out. Now, um, next, Star Al-Islam. 
Akhi Bilal, what do you think is going to happen in Syria within the next days? Um, I do think that the Syrian people um, are going to uh, start to come together. I do. I really do. Um, I've been to a lot of countries. I've visited almost every Arab country um, during my work. Uh, and I found that the, pe that the people who have the strongest um, drive and determination to be the Egyptian people and the Syrian people. No offense to any of the others, the Saudis, the Qataris, or uh, the Sudanese or anything like that. Um, but they have a lot of strength and willpower. They don't always have the best direction, but they do have a lot of strength and willpower. And therefore, I believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose these people and to carry this banner. And inshallah ta'ala, we're going to see better things in the days ahead. But it's going to take a big push from the Syrian people, from the people of knowledge <clears throat> speaking up, and also from people like you. We need people to re-engage back into what's happening here in Syria, because when the world, or I should say particularly the Muslim world, is not engaged in terms of what's happening here, then that gives rise to all kinds of charlatans to come out of the woodwork and just to just do their own thing. Um, let's take one final question here. And let, let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take one more. Um, let's... All right, uh, last question here is as follows. Um, all right. Priya Ahmed says, do you want to go back to New York? I'd like to go back to New York if I could go there just for a couple of days. I mean, yeah, sure. I'd like to go back and, and smell the grass in the house, um, or I should say, you know, in front of the house that I grew up in, uh, in, in, in New York. Um, I'd love that. But the work is here. And, you know, and so I'm not going to really just kind of tie myself down just to, you know, I'm going to go back to New York. I'm going to leave all the work that I'm doing here uh, for the Ummah. It's a big bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gave me a role to play in the, the conflict which is happening here and a role to play in saving lives. So, yeah, man, I'd like to go back to New York for a minute, but... I'm okay. I'm, I'm really okay. Maybe in 5, 10, 15, or 20 years, I'll find my way back there and I'll just look up some old friends. So we'll see. Look, everybody, we're going to have to leave it here. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, I'm always happy uh, to hear from you and the questions, comments, and concerns. My name is Bilal Abdul Kareem. Jazakum Allah khaira. I'm looking forward to next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. What about a cat?